I'm going to talk today, this morning, about uh, two people, Kant and Hegel. Uh, Kant uh, is, it was the person that uh, I think Ayn Rand is called the most evil person who ever existed. I think a friend of mine told me she also referred to him once as the uh, machine gunner of the mind. Uh, I don't think, uh, at least in his political philosophy, uh, he should he should be uh, treated in this way. He actually had some some ideas at any rate that were quite compatible or with classical liberalism, although there are others that are somewhat more questionable. Now Kant lived from uh, 1720 to 1804. He had a very uneventful life. He was uh, he spent his uh, entire adult life in the in the city of Königsberg in East Prussia. I think he he once visited a neighboring city for a short time, but that was the extent of his travels. He he did have though from his reading a detailed knowledge of all the cities in Europe, and he could uh, he would have at his at his house he would have a dinner party every night and he would uh, have conversations on all sorts of things with people who attended. He was famous for uh, his very regular habits and he, he believed in uh, having rules for everything. Uh, Annette Beyer has a very funny essay on Kant where she points out he had, uh, he thought there was some special method of walking that was more healthy where you would raise your feet off the ground when you walked, and he was very careful to do that whenever he walked. Uh, he, I mentioned uh, throughout the, the series of lectures I referred to Straussian interpretations where the Straussians contend there's a secret or hidden meaning in the text, and writers write very careful, the philosophers write in a very careful way to conceal their true message. Now. Uh, Kant actually had one statement in which he, he, he admits himself that he, he wrote in this way. This is sort of not, he's admitting that he was very careful. The, the episode was this. Uh, <clears throat> Kant's views on religion were, were, were quite unorthodox. Although he believed in God, at least, uh, he said he did, and I mean, he had arguments for the existence of God, the famous moral argument for the existence of God. He wasn't, uh, he didn't accept the orthodox uh, Lutheran teachings of the, of the Prussian state. So uh, under the uh, Prussian king Frederick William II, uh, there was a, the minister of education was a man called Wilner, He sent. Uh, he ha uh, he had the king send Kant an order not to write anything on the subject of religion. Kant's views were too controversial. So Kant replied, uh, "As your Majesty's faithful servant, I will, of course, obey and not write anything." But when uh, Frederick William II died, he was replaced by Frederick William III, Kant felt free to write about religion, and he did. In, he point, he, Kant pointed out the reason he wasn't bound, he felt he wasn't bound by his promise not to write about religion, was he'd said, as your majesty's faithful servant. So he felt he worded it in a very tricky way that this meant the promise was made just to that king, so he wasn't bound anymore by it. So this is an example of a sort of one case where uh, there is very careful writing. Uh, just in passing, as I mentioned Straussian, there, there is this, uh, the Straussian interpretation of Kant is, of course, that he's basically a Hobbesian, and <laughs> also the Kantians believe that the uh, 
the cons uh, metaphysics and epistemology really is just window dressing. What he was really interested in was political philosophy. The other, the other stuff is just a, a bit added extra. Uh, now, uh, the, for in political philosophy, there are two main uh, works that uh, I'll be considering. The uh, first one is the first part of part one of the metaphysics of morals, and also a uh, short book that Kant wrote called Perpetual Peace. But before I go into that, I want to say a little bit about uh, Kant's ethical theory because. Uh, we need to understand this in order to understand the uh, political philosophy. Uh, <coughs> Kant, uh, distinct in uh, ethical statements, or statements saying we ought to do something. Say uh, we ought to respect other people's rights. We ought to not to steal. And any statement of ought something telling us what to do, an imperative, uh, can, we can, can't distinguish two different kinds of imperatives. There are hypoth hypothetical imperatives and categorical imperatives. A hypothetical imperative is one that says, if you want such and such, if you have a certain goal, you should do this. Uh, if you want to be healthy, you should uh, eat nutritious food and exercise. Then, so that isn't saying you should unconditionally eat nutritious food and exercise. Just if you want that, if you want that goal, then you should do this. It, this kind of this is accepted by everybody. Thinks this is. Quite, uh, uh, there's nothing uh, strange about this. this uh, P, uh, everybody accepts this is a valid way of looking at uh, uh, imperatives. It's, they're all they can, an imperative is uh, how you achieve a goal. Now, within this hypothetical imperative, there's a special class which is called an assertoric imperative. Uh, Remember, hypothetical imperatives, if you want this, you should do, if you want such and such, you should do this. Now, supposing, in fact, everybody does want uh, something, so you have, then you have an assertoric imperative. It's hypothetical because it still states a goal. It's if you want this, then here's what to do. But Everybody does want it, so you can, in effect, drop out the if part of the sentence because everybody does want it. And Kant thought that there was such an assertoric imperative that uh, obtains, namely, he thought everybody wants his or her own happiness. This is a psychological law, according to him. we're all aim at our own happiness. So. He, uh, if you have an imperative that if you want to be happy, if you want a happy life, you should do such and such. If that's correct, if those uh, things are in fact needed to lead a happy life, then everybody uh, would have reason to do them. So those, that is a hypothetical imperative. Now, the controversial type of imperative is the second class, a categorical imperative. Now this is an imperative that just says do such and such or you ought to do this. There is no goal stated. It's not in order to achieve this you ought to do that. It's do this. So Kant thought that we could he could show by reason that there are such categorical imperatives. There is a categorical imperative of different versions of it. Now, uh, there, there was an art, famous article that came out in, published in the Philosophical Review in 1972 by uh, 
Philip of Foot, the famous British philosopher who was also the uh, granddaughter of Grover Cleveland, uh, called uh, morality as a system of hypothetical imperatives. And she thought that she argued that the notion of a categorical imperative in Kant says really doesn't make sense. Uh, we can certainly have uh, statements of the form do such and such. Suppose I say uh, in, in chess you can't move, uh, if your king is in check you, you, you have to move it. So I say you must move your king if it's in check. Well, that isn't, I've told you something you must do, but you have no reason to accept what I'm saying unless you're playing chess or you want to follow the rules of chess. So her point was we can certainly state categorical imperative. We can state, we can make imperatives without saying, uh, giving any uh, hypothetical that starts them off, any if clause saying why you should do that, but unless there's one that's presumed, then no one has a reason to do it. You would just have a statement. I'm saying, well, I say, uh, everyone take out your wallet and give me all your money. Uh, I, 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 certainly, I, I hope everybody does that, but you have no reason to do it. I just, just I mean, just so her argument was just that because uh, you could, you've stated a, a categorical statement that doesn't it can't has shown that anyone has any reason to follow any uh, categorical statement that she thought only hypothetical imperatives give someone a reason to do something. I think uh, to see though what Kant had in mind, I think we could start off by the simpler example than one he used. I'm supposing we say uh, you shouldn't have contradictory goals. Contradictory goals mean ones that can't be realized at the same time. Like I say, suppose I say uh, you can't both want to diet and eat whatever you want at the same time. So I think one could argue this is a, just a demand of reason. It isn't that there's no hypothetical involved, it's just a demand of reason that we not have desires of this contradictory kind. And what Kant was doing when he talked about categorical imperatives, he thought you could, you could get more out of reason than, just, than that, just avoiding contradictory demands. He thought there was, uh, you could, he, he thought reason had, we could learn more from reason than just this example. He thought, for example, uh, the famous uh, first version of the categorical imperative, uh, one would take the, you take the maxim of your action, that's to say, the maxim is a description of your, what you're doing, stating what you intend in doing that action. If you couldn't will that everyone do this action, then you would be violating reason. For example, he gives this example and people have disputed whether it would lead to a contradiction of a kind he, he said. He said, supposing uh, I, uh, I promise, say, to give somebody some money I mean, in an emergency, I, I, I borrow some money from someone in an emergency, and I promise to give it back to him, and I intend that I don't intend actually to give it back to him. So Kant said, well, could I will that everyone follow that maxim? And he said, no, because then if everybody did that, people would, knew about this, and no one would ever believe such a promise, so the institution of promising, or at least promises of that kind, would break down. So I would be contradicting myself if I made a promise of that kind. Uh, there are all sorts of complications in what the different kinds of contradiction are, but uh, this is the basic idea. So Kant thought we could get just by reason, 
uh, we could get categorical demands on what we should do. Uh, it, so not our demands are not just limited to uh, hypothetical. I want to just, uh, before I turn from the Kant's ethics to go into the political philosophy, I just want to add sort of a speculative idea. If Kant is right on what he says about the asetoric imperative that everybody wants to achieve his or her own happiness. Now, supposing uh, one finds plausible an Aristotelian account of what that how you achieve your happiness, then uh, uh, what uh, every you, you could take the categorical imperative as just saying if, if this uh, Aristotelian program is universalizable, then you could take you could really uh, all Kantian sort of standard Kantian ethics really drops out, and all you'd be saying is if Kant is right, is that the Aristote everybody has to follow the Aristotelian program. Because we have the asetoric imperative, everybody uh, it wants to do this, plus this is consistent, fulfills the universalizability maxim, so everyone's under an ethical obligation to do it, so you could get a kind of a Kantian argument for Aristotelianism that way. And you'd be adding to the Aristotelian program that not only is this the desirable way to, leave, to live, but it's obligatory. But as I say, this is just a speculative idea. Uh, now, in, uh, in Kant's view of ethics, and, uh, he places a great deal of stress on the on the will that say the the motive that you have in acting much more than the results of what you act. He said the only thing that is entirely good in itself is the the will to do good. The, the, so in uh, let's say supposing in the Kantian in Kant's view supposing that. Uh, I see some say a friend of mine is uh, is very sick, and I decide to help him out or take care of him because I'm very attached to this person. I I'm distressed by his being sick, and I want to help him. Have I done anything morally valuable? Uh, no, my actions don't have any moral merit. They would have moral merit only if I acted from duty. I, only if I said, well, I'm helping him because it, it's I ought to do so, because this is the right thing to do. Uh, now, this doesn't mean that I couldn't have uh, aff affectionate feelings for my friend at the same time, but that can't be the, the reason I do it, if, if what I'm doing is to have moral merit. This is, as you see, a very austere doctrine. It's... Uh, Really, you uh, you get moral merit for things only if you act from duty. Now, we could we might expect, and here we'd be surprised that if if someone holds this view, we might think that in politics they stress very much acting from the right motive. People need to act in an ethical way from the correct motive. But Kant doesn't take this position at all. Quite the contrary, he says that in politics we're concerned only with external actions. We're not concerned with what the motives people have. Politics is purely an external matter. We're concerned, say, as supposing uh, I owe you some money, and I, I have an ob legal obligation to pay you back. The legal system is concerned only with, do I pay you the money? If I paid you the money just because I'm afraid I'll be, I'll be arrested if I, don't, if I didn't or sued if I didn't, then I wouldn't be acting from an ethical motive in the Kantian way. I wouldn't be acting because I ought to pay you back the money, but still that suffices from the standpoint of the state, uh, all that counts is external action. So this is uh, 
Remember, I mentioned this in the lecture on Aquinas. Aquinas holds a similar position. And this is a basic idea in classical liberalism that the sphere of, action, of coercive action, the only case in which you can act coercively to someone involve violations of rights. Uh, you can't act to secure any other ethical goals. You can't, supposing you hold, say, that uh, certain types of sexual conduct are immoral, then in the classical liberal view, you can't prevent people from doing that unless they're violating people's rights. Uh, the mere fact that, say, they're doing something that's wrong isn't sufficient. Uh, you see, this is the, the Kantian classical liberal idea is completely going against the view that's held, say, by some uh, traditionalist conservatives uh, who say, or is held, uh, say, they say, there can't be a right to do wrong. You can't have a right to do something that's ethically wrong. Well, uh, in the Kantian view, classical liberal view, this would be a confused statement. It can't, it, it, it's, it's certainly true that it can't be right, it can't be ethically correct to do something that's wrong, but it certainly makes sense to say that someone has a sphere of action in which he's free to choose what to do, and it's wrong to coerce him within that sphere. And in that sphere of action, he might choose to do something that's wrong. Suppose you say people should be free to have the religious beliefs they want, but you might that's perfectly consistent with saying that people might be ethically wrong to adopt certain religious beliefs. So very important in this view that action, the, 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 act, the state politics concerned only with external action. Uh, so Kant, in saying that politics is concerned with external action, didn't at all abandon the basic point in his ethical theory where he's concerned with universalizability. Uh, he was still, he was still a key issue for him is what rules can be universalized. Just as in ethics, he's saying uh, we have to see how, what can the maximum of our action be adopted as a universal law. Here, he, he in politics, said can. Uh, can the, our, the laws we propose be universally applied, but he's not concerned with motives. Now, in adopting this view of importance of universalizability, can our legal proposed laws be universalized? Uh, Kant was very much influenced by Rousseau. Uh, so, uh, he had an interpretation of Rousseau's general will that makes it much less collectivist than Rousseau's own view of it. Uh, when Rousseau said, remember, in the, the general will, you imagine the whole community getting together and passing laws, everyone just, uh, votes a certain way, and then we see uh, the result is what everybody, the whole body, has decided. Kant took that to mean that uh, everyone, that what, what, you would, what each person should do is to ask what laws should, could universally apply. So he's taking it in a much more individualistic way than Rousseau. It isn't that everybody gets together and, and votes on measures each, that each person asks. Or we ask what can be consistently made universal. In, uh, Kant m mentioned when he discusses Rousseau, he said one thing he learned from Rousseau is the uh, in reading Rousseau, not just a social contract, but his novels and Emile, his work on education, in novel dealing with education. He said we learned the value. He learned the value of common people. He said before that he was inclined to think that. 
only intellectuals and philosophers himself really mattered, but after he read Rousseau, he realized the value of everyone. So he certainly uh, interpreted Rousseau in a rather way much more compatible with uh, classical liberalism than I was inclined to suggest Rousseau himself held. So he kind of he interpreted Rousseau in a very uh, in a way that uh, got the best out of him, I think. Uh, now he also held that in taking this view on the importance of the of universalizability, he felt he was modifying Plato in a certain way that remember Plato in the Republic had talked about ruled by the guardians, by the philosophers. He thought that by uh, Kant thought that by talking about what can be universalized, it, it, where everybody would be uh, acting according to universalizably universalizable maxim. He was making everybody, in effect, philosopher kings. He's, he's making the uh, elitist view democratic. It applies to everyone because everyone is acting through reason in following uh, these universal laws. Now, uh, when uh, Kant applied this idea of Remember, in politics, we're concerned with external action and we want laws that can be universalized. So in uh, considering how he applied this to property, he comes up in the first part of Metaphysics of Morals with some quite libertarian views. He says, first of all, he said, uh, we ask, do human beings have the right to acquire property, and he says they obviously do because uh, uh, property, uh, or just physical objects that has, there's nothing in property that would, that property it can't have, or land can't have rights by itself that would prevent us from taking it over. So uh, human beings clearly have the right to act, to benefit themselves, and they can uh, appropriate property. And unlike uh, Locke, Kant doesn't may have any, he said we can just acquire property by taking it into our possession. He doesn't have any elaborate treatment of provisos, or, or, we can't let things spoil. He just takes it as fairly obvious that we can, uh, that, that what we want to do is uh, appropriate, to convert parts of the whole surface of the globe to our own use. And he thinks it's desirable that the whole surface of the globe be put to human use. So that there, in his view, there shouldn't be any areas left over that aren't property. Uh, now, a key point here in that he, he, he is that uh, this goes very much along with his notion that uh, laws have to be universalizable. He says <coughs> rights have to be what he calls pro property rights, all rights include, uh, include property rights, have to be what he calls compossible. Uh, this uh, is a concept that, uh, compossibility is a concept that Leibniz, who the great uh, German philosopher, uh, stressed very much, and Kant was influenced by Leibniz to a great extent, although he broke with a lot of his philosophy. Now, what does compossibility mean? Well, uh, ordinary possibility, I can ask, is some, just say, is something possible? Like, uh, is it possible that I'm giving a lecture now? Well, yes, it is, since I actually am giving a lecture, therefore it's possible that I am. Now, it is it possible, say, for any one of you to give a lecture? Uh, I, yes, it is. Uh, say, you could imagine one of you coming up and giving the lecture instead of me. Much preferable state of affairs to the present one. Uh, but suppose I say, is it possible that at the same time uh, you and I are giving the only lecture now? 
uh, no, this would this isn't possible. So, compossibility means two th uh, two pos pos possibilities that can take place at the same time. Uh, so, from the fact that A is possible and B is possible, it doesn't follow that A and B are compossible. That has to be established on a case by case basis. It does follow if A and B are compossible that A is possible and B is possible, but the inference doesn't go the other way. So Kant says it's, it's a requirement of reason that all rights be compossible. We have to have all rights capable of being exercised at the same time. Uh, and now when he applies this to property, <coughs> This is where he gets some very interesting results. He says, uh, well, let's imagine that people, let's say a group of people, uh, take uh, land in a certain area into their possession. So you have a number of people. Each one is making claim, a claim to a certain part of, la of land. Now, he thinks it's very likely that people have disputes about the various land claims. One person will say, well, the proper principle of initial acquisition of land is such and such. So you mix your labor with it. And somebody else says, no, uh, I think just, uh, just saying that you want to have this part of land is enough. And even if people have the same principle, you have all sorts of disputes. How far does your boundary go? Have you taken... Uh, uh, are you taken so, uh, too much in your claim uh, that it's unreasonable that we should accept that you can own all that? We can imagine all sorts of disputes about this. So Kant thinks that because the, these, we have these disputes, we, he, there's no way people could figure out just by reasoning what's the proper principle of initial acquisition, how can we resolve these? We have to take the claims that, uh, to property rights that people make in the state of nature, let's say the state where this, the uh, state affairs where there's no authority saying what, how these questions should be settled. We have to take these claims as provisional. So people have property rights in the state of nature, but they're provisional because there are disputes about them. I say, I own this room, and then uh, Lou Rockwell said, no, you don't own this room. So we have a dispute about that. Uh, so ha, ha, uh, my cl if, as, if there is no uh, legal authority, then cl my claims are provisional. Now, here's where I think Kant makes an interesting point. Remember, he thinks it's an imperative of reason that we have, we have both property rights, we can't just say we don't want to have property rights. This would be uh, uh, not in our interest, the interest of human beings to do this. Remember, we all have this assertoric imperative. We want to live happy lives. We won't be able to do that unless we have property rights. But we want all the property to become possible. And we don't have that if we just have these provisional claims to rights. So Kant says, well, then we are under an imperative of reason to set up a state that will uh, uh, settle these questions and say what the boundaries of the rights are. The state, in doing that, can't just set aside the provisional cl claim rights that people have. It has to just uh, consider them all and kind of get them in a consistent form try to solve the coordination problem. So in that way, we would have a set of compossible rights. So Kant says, really, from the notion of property rights, he thinks he can show, he can show that people are under an imperative to set up a state. I think, uh, looking at his argument, I think we should, it, it would be, his argument would have been better had he said, people are under an imperative to set up certain 
to resolve this dispute, say, by uh, agreeing on some kind of common law code. I don't think he showed that we have to have a state to do this, but you can see how this, at any rate, I think is a, a very interesting argument that he has. Uh, Now, it, besides his uh, work on property rights in the first part of Metaphysics and Moral, he also made a contribution to classical liberalism in his uh, uh, short book, uh, 1795, called Perpetual Peace. Uh, here, he's, uh, he's st extremely critical of war and colonialism. He doesn't like, he, he thinks these are very bad uh, institutions. And he calls, he said, in order to uh, avoid war, we should, ha we should have a, a federation of the various states of the earth where they would each agree not to engage in aggressive war. And he doesn't want, contrary to what sometimes Suppose he doesn't want a world government. He thinks this would be uh, tyrannical if you had a single state that was ruling the entire world. But what he wants is a federation of states that would uh, agree not to engage in war. And he thinks that it's desirable that each of these states be a republic because he, he thinks that in a republic, uh, in order to go where in order to go to war you would need the permission of the of the people in people that you couldn't then have the let's say a despot or a king just decide to go to war because he thought it was in someone's the, his interests or the nation's interest he thought you if you needed popular consent for a war then people would be unlikely to engage in war. This is sort of the beginnings of what's called democratic peace theory. Uh, this doesn't, I, I don't think his work, his, this theory has worked out entirely in, in practice because uh, the uh, democratic states, the uh, ones that are, uh, have tended to be uh, very warlike, say if you look at American foreign policy, it's certainly not one of pure pacifism. But Kant may have had an answer to this because he, he could say he, what he believes in is not democracy, but he has sort of a much, uh, what he thinks the best system is a republican system, in which you don't have direct rule by the people at all. It's just the people, there's sort of a popular consent to going to war, but he doesn't uh, favor democracy, so he, he's not really exactly the same as democratic peace theory. His criticism of democracy, incidentally, is that direct democracy is uh, unusual. He says, well, if you have direct democracy, then it's supposed to be that all the people are ruling, but in fact, some of the people, namely the ones in the minority, are not ruling. So he thinks this is somehow a contradiction that he's saying, well, you're supposed to have direct rule by everybody, but in fact, some people don't agree. I don't think this is a very good argument because in democracy, you're not saying that you want unanimous consent, but uh, he, he, at any rate, that's uh, the argument. He, he does give that argument. Uh, now, I, I mentioned two examples where I think Kant has made valuable contributions to classical liberalism, at least very interesting one, namely his defense of property and his uh, advocacy of a peaceful foreign policy. But there is one area I think he, his views are quite a bit more questionable, and here the critics of Kant I think have a point against him. Uh, he thought that resistance to the state is never justifiable. You can never uh, illicitly overthrow a gover uh, the government. Revolutions are always out. It's not clear, I find it a little unclear why he thought that, but that was his view. He, here, I think we can see uh, 
tendency in his thought, and, uh, both uh, John Dewey and George Santayana in their respective books on German philosophy pointed this out, they were rather better critics of Kant, I think, than Ayn Rand. They point out there's a tendency in Kant and other German thinkers to stress the inner very much. Remember I said in in ethics, Kant is concerned with the will, although he doesn't apply this to politics. But here, the stress on the inner, in talking about revolution, the stress on the inner return, because he's thinking that as you, if even if this, the state does something that's very bad, you don't have to internally approve of it. And if you don't, that's sufficient. You, you're not justified in taking action against the state that would be acting in a, to act illegally is, according to him, always wrong. Uh, I think if uh, you're interested in looking at this issue further, uh, Santayana's book called Egotism in German Philosophy is very much worth reading. It's uh, much, he had a much better style than John Dewey, so I won't mention Dewey's book, uh, but I think Santayana is uh, point is very much worth reading. Now, as I say, Kant uh, said re revolution is never justifiable. However, there's an odd consequence to this. Supposing a revolution, supposing some people don't agree with Kant and they wage a successful revolution, then uh, can you have a can you go to war against the revolutionary regime to restore the old system? Uh, Kant said, no, you can't, because then you'd be revolting against that government. So something like revolution is always bad, but if it succeeds, then you can't change that either. So, and in fact, Kant was very enthusiastically in favor of the French Revolution, although he opposed some of the excesses, such as the execution of the king in January 1793. But he was a very much a supporter of the French Revolution, it, even though from his own theory, he, he would have to say that the revolutionaries shouldn't have done what they did. But once they did it, that was all right. Uh, there's an interesting parallel, I think, with the views of a uh, 20th century libertarian, as some of you may know, <coughs> Robert Lefebvre. Uh, Lefebvre thought that, uh, had standard views say that uh, theft and uh, aggression are wrong, but supposing someone steals something from you, say, uh, while you're not looking, he just reaches into your pocket and takes your wallet away. Uh, he had no right to do that, but once he's done it, you can't legitimately use force to take it away from him. So it's a somewhat Kantian view there that uh, uh, you see. And then if you did use force and got it away from him, then he couldn't do anything about it. So it's, uh, I don't think it's a contradictory view, but it's at least paradoxical. So uh, what I've tried to show so far is that, uh, although there are points one can criticize in, in Kant, he's quite uh, much of what he says is quite compatible with classical liberalism. And when I turn, to, we turn now to the other person I want to talk about, uh, Hegel, uh, matters are a bit different. Uh, Hegel was definitely not a classical liberal. And before, I want to read uh, one of the people who was the mo one of the most anti-Hegelian of all uh, philosophers was Arthur Sch Schopenhauer, uh, who's a somewhat uh, younger contemporary. Uh, Schopenhauer, when he, he was actually, uh, Hegel was on his doctoral examining committee. He got through the exam all right. But then he scheduled lectures at the same time as Hegel, who was the most popular philosophy professor. No one came to Schopenhauer's lecture, so he had a grudge against Hegel ever afterwards. But he had a description of Hegelian philosophy I'd like to read. Uh, uh, if some of you uh, read my reviews, you think I'm bad, wait till you 
here, this one. Uh, how Schopenhauer says, uh, Hegel, installed from above by the powers that be as the certified great philosopher, was a flat-headed, insipid, nauseating, illiterate charlatan who reached the pinnacle of audacity in scribbling together and dishing up the craziest mystifying nonsense. This nonsense has been noisily proclaimed as immortal wisdom by mercenary followers and readily accepted as such by all fools who thus join into as, per into as perfect a chorus of admiration as had ever been heard before. The extensive field of spiritual influence with which Hegel was furnished by those in power has enabled him to achieve the intellectual corruption of a whole generation. Oh, his, his enthusiasm for Hegel was rather contained. Uh, 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 we'll see whether, to what extent, he was justified in his uh, views on Hegel. Uh, Hegel lived from uh, 1770 to 1830. He, he was, uh, <coughs> he became a professor of philosophy University of Berlin, which had been established uh, early in the 19th century. Uh, his main work on politics is called The Philosophy of Right, which came out in 1821. It was uh, ba based on lectures he'd given on uh, politics over, over many years. and. Uh, he wrote, other, he wrote other essays on politics. He had an early essay on the German constitution, uh, in constitutional reform. And uh, his, last, his last essay, in fact, was a criticism of the English Reform Bill of 1832. I've always wondered uh, how Hegel wrote this essay, criticizing the English Reform Bill of 1832, because he died in 1831. Uh, actually, it was the bill had been dis was in discussion quite a bit before it was passed, so that was what he was writing about. Uh, the uh, basic uh, principle H Hegel in the philosophy of right. Uh, uh, I should say before I go into the philosophy of right, I'll just say a few words about the Hegel's f general philosophy, which is extremely difficult to understand. Uh, the basic, the real point of Hegel's philosophy, I think we can grasp perhaps, if you recall uh, something I said when I was talking about Aristotle. Remember, Aristotle thought that substances have natures and everything has certain essential properties, things, the properties that make it what it is. And some uh, uh, some substances don't fully achieve their essence immediately. Uh, say, if the example I gave, say an uh, oak tree starts off as a seed, and then there's a, in the Aristotelian view, there's a process of growth. It's guided by its end, by what it sh its and in fact, the full development of its nature, and this guides its growth to until it achieves its full nature. So what Hegel really did was say, this view applies to the entire universe. We should take the entire universe as a single substance that has, whose nature is to be completely rational. So the entire world would become really the absolute mind or God. This, I'm not going to go into how, whether we should say this process takes place in time or not. That's a very controverted issue. But what we see is that Hegel thought there was a process by which mind or spirit is constantly becoming more and more uh, uh, realized in, the, in history. So the, imagine, say, you imagine sort of the world is a gigantic syllogism. It's reason uh, enacted. Uh, now, what Hegel was trying to do in his basic theme of his political philosophy was this. Uh, he said that 
a, a problem that people have. Remember, here again, here's one another uh, philosopher who's influenced by Rousseau. Remember, when I was talking about Rousseau on the discourse on inequality and discourse on arts and sciences, where he criticized the division of labor, he said people are, Rousseau said people are alienated from the world. They think that uh, they don't lead fully contained lives by themselves. They they fight, they're, they're at op in opposition to other people, they're dependent on others, so they don't have, uh, they're not happy anymore. What Hegel wanted to do was he, he felt that in his political philosophy, wanted, in philosophy of history, he wanted to show, uh, the main theme is reconciliation, he wanted to show how we could view the world in a certain way, where even if bad things happen, we can see these as, rationally required so uh, we can be reconciled to them. In his uh, famous sentence in his uh, philosophy, his so-called double sentence, uh, what is rational is actual and what is actual is rational. So he's saying reason is not some abstraction apart from the world. We know it's present in the world and also what is in the world is reasonable. We don't, it's not fully evident how it's reasonable right away, but this is coming about more and more. We'll see, Hegel thinks, as history goes on, we see how the world is becoming more and more reasonable. And Hegel says in the, in the uh, uh, forward to the philosophy of right, he says that it's foolish for a philosopher to try to come up with some ideal system that people should do. What, uh, he said, philosophy is its own time comprehended in thought. So what he's going to do is not come up with some kind of revolutionary scheme that will overthrow things, but he wants to explain why the existing state of history is the one that reason requires. So people, if they accept this, will be reconciled to the world. Now, in carrying out this, this program, he follows this famous uh, dialectical method. This is where he gets his part that's hard to understand. What he, do, what he does throughout his work, he'll start with a certain category, and then he'll show claims to show there's something incomplete about that category, so it will somehow go into its opposite, not, all, not necessarily the logical contradictory, but somehow there'll be an, uh, another side of the, co the new concept will be a, a sort of something opposed to the first concept. And then there's a, a, another stage where there's a, union of these first two stages and then somehow this higher concept really takes both the previous ones into account while modifying them. Uh, sometimes people call, say, refer to the Hegelian triad. You've sometimes heard this, you know, people say thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Hegel really doesn't use those terms very much. That's more to be found in Fichte, the earlier, somewhat earlier German thinker who uh, coming between uh, Kant and Hegel, but uh, Hegel had, certainly has the, this concept regardless of what, this way of doing things, regardless of whether he uses the term or not. So uh, in political philosophy, what Hegel does, and this is where he gets into the, where reason into his anti-classical liberalism position, why I think one's justified calling him an enemy of liberty, is that he starts off with a certain concepts that seem quite compatible in many respects with classical liberalism, but then they're overcome by the contrary, by the next concept. And Hegel claims that the truth in the early concept has been taken up in the higher concept, but in fact it's really canceled. I should say one, one other thing I should have mentioned uh, when you get the new concept, you know, I said you have the first concept, then there's the contradictory one, the, the opposing one, I should say, and then there's the 
synthesizing concept. Then you start the triad again. It, Hegel calls this one the, the, the old synthesizing concept becomes the new start of a new triad. He calls this a collapse into immediacy because you were looking at the concept in the, the first time as combining two concepts. Now you're viewing it as kind of a single concept. There's going to be a new opposition to that. Now, I, I must say I find uh, this uh, somewhat incomprehensible. I think for once uh, the fault is not in my exposition of it, but with the actual philosophy itself. Uh, but now, to get now to what Hegel does in philosophy, right, now he start, the, the work is in three sections. He start, the first one is called abstract right, and this is the one that's compatible with classical liberalism. Uh, here, Hegel says, uh, he's asking, remember the theme of philosophy is how does reason or spirit, geist, manifest itself in the world? Well, he says, uh, the, it's reasonable to take spirit first as manifesting itself in individual human beings. So if you have, say, an individual person, one it, way the person can try to uh, make the world rational is to impose his will on the outside world. So if you have say I'm a human being, I have a mind, so by imposing my will on lifeless matter, I'm uh, an instance of the growth of reason in the world. And how do I do this? According to Hegel, it's by appropriating property to myself. So Hegel says property has to, it, it, what he says, you have uh, individual, is can seize property, just takes over land, and it becomes his. So Hegel is in favor of property rights. And he says at the same time that one can't seize other people. If you seize someone else, they try to appropriate him and claim him as your property, that would be illegitimate because to exercise reason properly, you're you must exercise your reason on something that doesn't have reason, on an inanimate object. And uh, because of this, he's very critical. He says slavery is never justifiable. And he criticizes the ancient Greeks, whom he's usually very fond of for allowing slavery. He says this is never justifiable. Now, so far, he sounds pretty good. Now, he goes on from there to, uh, say, uh, talk about contracts in a fairly standard way. He says that if uh, people validly own property, then they can have exchanges, and he describes various kinds of contracts. Then he said, well, what happens if people don't observe con the contracts properly, they violate the contract, then we can have uh, uh, justifiable punishment of people for uh, violating the contracts. And here is where he starts to get into some of the material that's a bit uh, very questionable. He says uh, we could distinguish uh, what kind of violations can we have. He said, well, we can distinguish uh, ones where people want to keep the uh, really want to observe the law properly, they want to, don't want to violate anybody's ethical obligations, but they just make a mistake about things. Suppose I think that uh, I'm, uh, uh, you claim I owe you some money, and I, I think I really don't. I've just made a mistake. I do, so I don't pay you. So then you can sue me for the money, but I haven't, I'm not, ethically at fault unless I was very negligent in thinking that I didn't uh, owe you the money because I, I just made a mistake. Then we can, he then said, well, we, we can take cases of fraud where I'm uh, deliberately doing something against the contract, but I'm not repudiating the whole notion of law altogether. 
And then he thinks of more severe crimes where, say, if I used violence against you, then I'd be saying, in effect, that there shouldn't be a system of laws at all. I, I, so there he said, this is typical, typically Hegelian, he says, this is something like an infinite negative judgment. When he says it's like S is not P, it's infinitely negative. What that's supposed to mean, I couldn't really say, but that's what he says. So now, what happens if someone acts in, in, this, in this very bad way? Then Hegel says he can be punished. And here he claims that by punishing the person who committed a crime in this sense, you're annulling what he's done. Uh, supposing, uh, say, it's very hard to see what Hegel, why Hegel thinks this. I mean, supposing, say, I can't resist the temptation to take, uh, to hit somebody over the head and take money from him. I do that, and then I'm sent to prison for a long time. Then this is certainly bad for me, but it's not clear how that annuls what the crime, but Hegel thinks that it does, that somehow the punishment renders uh, what the criminal has done a nullity. It makes it as if it had never happened. <clears throat> I think much, much more sense if we look at Aristotle's view when he talks about corrective justice, because what Aristotle says is when someone has, got, has violated someone's rights, when it's done something wrong, what you're supposed to do is restore the previous situation. If, uh, say, I stole money from you, then I have to give it back to you. So we get to the previous situation. But it isn't that in giving you back the money, I've annulled what I've done. It's just that you it's your money, so the just situation is one that restores what it was before. But uh, that isn't the way Hegel views it. And he goes further, he says that the criminal himself should accept this. He should take into his own mind, his own will, that he should be punished so that he can annul what he's done. Uh, now this leads us to the second section of philosophy right, which deals with personal morality. And here, what Hegel is really doing is making a criticism of Kant's approach to ethics. Remember, Kant, as I mentioned, stresses the inner will, how it's not enough to, it, to act uh, morally correctly, to do the right thing. You have to act from the intention of doing your duty. Now, Hegel agrees that people have to act from, have to have the intention of doing their duty, but he says this is a extremely a too abstract a notion because it doesn't, if you just say I have to do my duty, it doesn't have any content to it. He said, uh, what, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to say I'm supposed to do my duty, but I don't know what that is. There has to be someone there has to be some way of saying what it is I'm supposed to do. It isn't enough just to act uh, according to a pure will. It, uh, he said, he, uh, 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 he says, uh, he says something like, in I think in this section, uh, the the the, mo the motive of pure the motive of pure willing are the oh no sorry the laurels of pure willing are are uh, are barren leaves that are net that are never green so he's saying pure willing doesn't achieve anything it's just an empty abstraction and uh, he opposes what he calls uh, morality for morality's sake there always has to be some specified content and it isn't enough for the specified content just to be something like a general maxim, like uh, love your neighbor as yourself or, uh, some, or anything of that kind. 
you have to have specific content telling you what to do. And pure abstraction doesn't do this. Now we get into, I think, one of the real areas where I think what Schopenhauer said was, was justifiable, where Hegel gets really dangerous. He said uh, one form of this uh, stress on pure willing, which is, remember, it's a stage that one goes through in getting to the, in the growth of reason, but it's one that he has a lot of criticism, is people will say they have to act according to conscience. Suppose you think, uh, imagine, say, uh, you, you get a, you're drafted into a war you consider unjust, and you say, I can't uh, obey that order because it would go against my conscience to do so. Or you say, <coughs> I think that uh, I'm not going to follow, say, certain uh, racially restrictive laws in the South uh, during the 1950s because my conscience tells me these are bad laws. I'm not going to do this. So Hegel says uh, this is an, if you say you should follow your conscience, this is evil. You shouldn't follow what your conscience says because if you do that, you're just saying that morality is what I arbitrarily decide to be right. It's just I think something is wrong, therefore I shouldn't do it. And what happens if people adopt that attitude? Then he says this is the identical attitude to the worst evildoer, because the worst, the worst evildoer will say, I don't care what the conventions say, I'm going to do this. I don't care, say, that uh, according to morality, I'm not supposed to murder anybody if I think, say, the Jews in Germany should all be gotten rid of, I'm going to do that. It's uh, sort of the evildoer would be saying, I'm going to act as my will, as my will dictates. And Hegel says, this is exactly what following your own conscience amounts to. You're saying you're doing what uh, you think is right. So uh, Hegel comes up with the repellent view that you ought not to follow your conscience if it goes against customary morality. The customary morality, not by coincidence, is the next section, the final section of the philosophy of right. Uh, <coughs> here, the uh, German term that Hegel used for uh, customary morality is very important in his philosophy Right, so people. Zitlichkeit kind of means sort of a. Uh, no, oh, I did it again. I always do that. It's customary. Uh, all right, so it's that sort of a customary instit institutionalized form of morality. We have certain, in a society, we have certain institutions that tell us what is the right thing to do. Hegel thinks that this is an ethical substance that really exists. It's not just, it, uh, it's not just an abstraction. It's not just, say, there's certain customs and institutions. But these are all unified. And so uh, they form a substance. And people in following customers sometimes unconscious or very often unconscious of what the why the law the customs are in effect, and he cites uh, Antigone's statement that uh, no one knows where the eternal laws come from. But he thinks uh, certain classes of people, uh, probably philosophers such as himself, were able to bring to consciousness what the ethical substance is. So. Uh, uh, in developing the, his view of the ethical substance, uh, he, again, as you would expect from Hegel, he ha goes into a, a triad. And he starts off with the family, 
and he holds, again, it, it, remember what he's talking about is ethical substance. There's it, sort of an institution that really exists apart, or is not just composed of the individual, say the husband and wife, are not just two separate individuals. That would be, if you took, look put it that way, that would be going back to abstract right, the first stage we've already gotten through this. So he says husband and wife should be viewed as one person. They're one entity, and the husband is the uh, ruling entity. And in fact, he had a very low opinion of women's intelligence. And if, when he met, say, uh, intellectual women who would ask him questions about his philosophy, he would just switch the conversation to something else or just brush them off. So also uh, he thought it's desirable because ma uh, the family is an institution uh, uh, guiding individuals what to do. It's desirable that individuals not get married by their own choice, but that the parents arrange people's marriages. And, uh, Children naturally should be very strictly disciplined and not allowed to exercise initiative by themselves. The parents will have to train them very strictly in what to do. Now, the second part of this, of this stage, remember we're in the third part of the uh, philosophy of, of right, the one on customary morality. Now we're gone from the family, now we're into the next stage, which is civil society. Here, Hegel in, has some uh, things to say that aren't so bad. He, he's very much aware of the need for a division of labor and the market, and he realizes that institutions can develop uh, just on the market without requiring governmental control. And he favors individual property rights, he says. And he also says the law shouldn't discriminate among uh, people uh, on the basis of religion. He said we shouldn't say the, uh, something like a, uh, someone is a German or a Frenchman or a Jew. We should have everyone. The law applies to everyone in the same way. So he does, though, uh, although he studied uh, English and Scottish political economy, he doesn't think that the market really will work in the way that the uh, uh, the British economists thought. He thought he, he had a sort of a pre-Keynesian view. He thought that, or actually a pre-Marxist view also, that the market would generate, if it left to itself, a poor class of people, he calls this the rabble who will not be able to earn a, a living just on the pure free market. So uh, some uh, Marxists viewed Hegel as a precursor to Marx in this respect in saying that the capitalism jet, jet will lead to the uh, class of people, the proletariat, increasingly getting worse off. There's a book, a short book, uh, by a French uh, writer been translated into English, Eric Weil, called Hegel in the State. Uh, notice I didn't cover up what I wrote this time. So uh, Hegel then allows, as you say, has some, uh, gives some place for the, for the market, although it's a subordinate place and one the government can overrule. Now we get to the the key part, the third part on the state, this is, remember, we're still in the section on, uh, on customary morality. Now, he, he says that the state the, uh, is the is divine idea on earth. The state is the march of God on the earth. So really, the it, the, in the state, really, we have the highest development of rationality before we get to the next stage of Hegel's system, which I'm not going to be talking about today, art, religion, and philosophy. But so far, the state is the highest growth of rationality. So people have to be completely subordinate to the state. So 
Remember, I mentioned before, he said people have individual rights and property rights. Didn't sound all right, but he thinks if necessary, the state can overrule these because uh, you're real, the, the, you really, the state is the incarnation of reason and it's higher than individuals. If an individual were to say, I'm not going to do what the state says, then he would be going back to the mistake of following his own conscience and he would be an evil person. He, would, he ought to go along with the customary morality and uh, do what the state orders. Uh, when uh, Hegel talks about the state, he doesn't mean, he doesn't mean a, a, a world state. He thinks there are particular states, separate states, and it's necessary that a state, for a state to exist, that it be in opposition to other states. This it defines it as an entity that it faces other states, including uh, possible enemies. And in a lot, uh, going along with this, uh, Hegel thinks that war is very often desirable, at least sometimes desirable, because this helps pe people become less corrupt. When there's a war going on, uh, people will be unified and be willing to sacrifice to uh, protect the state. And these ethical, ethical motives become dominant, where in peacetime, people become too much concerned with luxury and just living for themselves. And so wars are from time to time necessary. Uh, uh, and he refers to one phrase to hussars as a type of knight, hussars and shining sabers. He's, he rather likes war. Uh, now, uh, what kind of state does Hegel want, think is the best kind? He thinks that uh, a monarchy is by far the best kind of, of uh, state because in a monarchy, uh, monarchy expresses fully, more fully than other type of states, the unity of reason. He thinks, uh, supposing, say, uh, I'm trying to decide something, I have, I have some important decision to make, and there are all sorts of considerations on one side or the other, so I'm weighing up all the pros and cons of something, deciding what to do, then there's a moment of unity where I have to say, well, these are the one side, this is the other. Now I've made my decision. This is it. There's a sort of an act, a, a single act of will being the final decision. So Hegel thinks this, the monarch is, represents this in the state. The monarch is a single person who's, uh, who's enacted all laws into being. The decision comes through him. So if you didn't have a monarch, there wouldn't be, reason wouldn't be uh, fully in effect. You wouldn't have this parallel with human reason in the way I've explained. But this doesn't mean the monarch is absolute or can do anything he wants. Quite the contrary, the monarch is, is, is constitutional and all he really does is ratify what the uh, what the other parts of the government have done. His key role is just he is the focus of unity for the whole state. Uh, Hegel thought there should be a legislature, but this would not, a bicameral legislature, two houses, but this would not be one where people would vote as we do for uh, uh, representatives, but there would be there were uh, state, there were uh, estates, sort of, uh, such as the agricultural estate or uh, uh, the other estate, sort of uh, other estates in the kingdom, meaning the sort of classes of uh, people that were worthy of representation, and these would be represented separately. So you wouldn't have uh, you wouldn't have people voting for particular people, there would just be certain groups like groups of businessmen or uh, 
groups of farmers and these would have representation. It's very much along the lines of what was later put into effect in uh, the Italian fascist government, corporatism. And in fact, the foremost uh, philosopher of Italian fascism, Giovanni Gentile, was a very ardent Hegelian. So he got some of the ideas for what he wanted from Hegel on this point. So we have the corporate representation. Uh, there is also, and this is one of the most important things Hegel said, there is a, a bureaucratic class that Hegel placed a great deal of stress on government administrators who would be, bureaucracy would be impartial and be uh, enact reason by it being impartial. This would be much more, they would be much more important than the people because although Hegel thought uh, the government should be aware of public opinion, it should also, if necessary, treat public opinion with contempt. Uh, now, in the last uh, section of, last chapter of uh, Philosophy of the Right, uh, Hegel ha is on the development of history, and Hegel now says it's not only that we have particular states that exist at a time, but at each time in history, uh, one state will be the most important, will be, the reason will be present in one state rather than another. Uh, he trait has a whole scheme of things where you start off with the Orient where only one man, namely the ruler, is free, everyone else isn't free, and you have a development of freedom, at least freedom in his sense, going throughout history. There's a the Greek stage in which you have independent sources of consciousness. And it's interesting, in his treatment of the, the Greeks, he placed a great deal of stress on that the Greek cities were guided by oracles in making important decisions. This is extremely important for some reason. Then he goes on, he describes the Roman world, and he thinks here there is a separation between individual co individuals and what the state is doing. So individuals just uh, think of what they should do in an inner way. They don't carry out their, their views of what's ethically proper into action. He discusses the Stoics here. And then uh, the highest stage so far is the Germanic world. And by the Germanic world, he means not just Germany, but all of Western Europe, and he thinks this is where reason has ended, the high stage of reason so far. I'll just end with one story. Uh, it involves uh, uh, this point on the Germanic world. Uh, there was a proposal uh, one time, I think in the 1950s, that Karl Popper, who was a very strong opponent of Hegel, uh, should be appointed to a chair at the uh, University of Chicago. So uh, Leo Strauss, who was a professor that was very, very much opposed to this, and he wrote to Eric Vogelin, who was a, another uh, very famous historian of philosophy. He said, uh, can you tell me what's your opinion of Karl Popper? And Popper I, I mean, Vogelin wrote back, always said, uh, Popper is no good, he he's really doesn't know anything. And one of the points he made, it was very funny, you know, I uh, knew Vogelin somewhat, he was tended to be quite arrogant. And he said this, something like, this man is so stupid that he thinks by the Germanic world Hegel means Germany. Can you imagine anything like that? So then, Strauss replies to him, thanks very much for your letter. You've done a tremendous good. Now we've been able to get rid of Popper. So uh, I just thought that would be an appropriate story to finish the lecture. So uh, all right, we'll now have any, we have a little time for questions. Uh, Rodney. There's one aspect of Hegel that some people thought could be taken in a libertarian direction. It's not in the philosophy of right, but in the phenomenology of spirit. The stuff on the master slave or mm -hmm. Lord and Bondsman uh, mm -hmm. idea, where the 
uh, it seems as though the master has the power, but because the slave is the one who's actually interacting with the material world and actually transforming it, and the master is merely a parasite, in some sense it's the slave who has the true power. And although that's been seen as a precursor of Marx and the proletariat, Christopher argues it's also a precursor of uh, Ayn Rand's conception of, uh, of parasitism and, and so forth. I just uh, mentioned that. Well, the, the question was, uh, some people uh, have suggested that there is an aspect of Hegel that could be taken in a libertarian way, specifically in the phenomenology in the famous section on the dialectic of, of uh, master and slave, where it's, although the master is first dominant, then the slave is really gets the upper hand because the master is parasitic on him, and then the consciousness really develops through the slave, not the master. So uh, I think it's right that one could, and Hay goes on to say how we get the notion of mutual reg recognition here. I think it's right that one could see this in a, take, get a libertarian view of this, but that's not what Hegel did with it. You know, he developed, he, he would, he didn't say, well, okay, now we're, well, he did say, uh, you, we shouldn't have, he definitely did say, and I mentioned that we shouldn't have slavery and we should all have individual rights, but then this is trans, and that we, we can get that, you're right to bring the phenomenology, that we can get that to that stage, and we stop there then, that's perfectly fine, but then remember Hegel wanted to go further and then these individuals are transcended by the state, you know, they, they have to be subordinate to the state, so I think you're, you're right that you could you could get to libertarian conclusion if, say, you just toss out parts two and three of philosophy of rights, stay with the section on abstract right. That would be a good thing too. I should mention also, uh, of course, the great uh, book on this is uh, by uh, Kojev, Alexander Kojev, on in, uh, introduction to the reading of Hegel. He was the one who really stressed that section of the <laughs> phenomenology. Uh, Matthew. Uh, you have, I'm, okay, I probably don't have a great expertise on Hegel that you do, but I've read, I've read some Hegel and you kind of mentioned that he had like, I know there's a book called Philosophy of History, but he might cover the same themes in another place. But in any event, you kind of pointed out that his idea that evolution of reason is that, okay, in the Oriental world, there's a tendency toward personal monarchy or autocracy where the only person is free is about, you know, I'm in the room. Yeah. And then there's like this evolution toward, you made the point about what he terms the Germanic world as, mm -hmm. you know, the highest stage being European reason. Um, Hegel thought that Africa was a dark continent that had no reason. Yeah. And that's a part of his philosophy of history, too. And He's not the only one to think that way, but I'm wondering, what do you think the consequences of a philosophy of history that thinks Africa has no reason, what do you think the consequences uh, is for conceptions of reason in the world? Uh, uh, the question was, uh, uh, I mentioned in my talk something about Hegel's philosophy of history where there's development of reason from the or starting with the Orient going to the uh, Western Europe as it existed in his time. And it is pointed out that Hegel said that uh, Africa is a completely dark continent. There is no, no, no reason at all there. And what is the consequence for uh, Hegel's philosophy of considering Africa in that way? Uh, Well, I think uh, uh, if Hegel had been, of course, remember at that time, uh, Hegel was very dependent on what the historical material available to him was. So he wasn't claiming, he was just dealing with what he had to go on. I think if he'd known more, if, if when uh, people started studying African and uh, 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 civilization, more American uh, uh, civilizations, they'd be Incas and Mayas and 
in Central and South America more, then I think you, you wouldn't be able to take such a linear view of things. I say, this is all, but the reason is you'd have to have a more pluralistic view. And I think uh, philosophies of history who had more material to work on, such as Oswald Spengler, did have a more pluralistic conception, although Spengler didn't say anything about Africa either. But I mean, I think it, you know you could extend that and bring more, you, you would just not be able to have such a view. It's interesting you mentioned that because Eric Vogel, remember the one I had the funny letter on Hegel, uh, in his philosophy of history, he had to develop it. He thought that he'd started off with kind of a linear system in his great work, uh, Order and History, which he planned to have in six volumes. And he found he couldn't carried out when he learned more about other civilizations. And in the in volume f uh, four, and he changed his organization plan, in uh, f volume four called the Ecumenical Age of Vogel System, he has a nonlinear system where we have all sorts of different civilizations going on at the same time. Well, uh, I think we're out of time now, so thanks very much. <laughs>